Thank you to the team this morning for leading us. If you've got your Bibles, uh, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 9 this morning. We're through a long series uh, through the book of Hebrews. Um, so as you're turning there, uh, in my studies I stumbled upon uh, the uh, theologian and ecclesiastical historian by the name of Cole Truman. Uh, he's a brilliant writer. Uh, but one of his books uh, that I read, which is the the Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Cole Truman's Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, is a, a book that I recommend to any human being who wants to understand the world we now live in. He kind of poses the question and answers it. Where did all this idea of, you know, a man can be a woman and a woman can be a dog and a helicopter or whatever they want to be, where did this all come from? Where did this woke ideas and ideologies come from? And, and Cole Truman does probably one of the best explorations of this that I've ever read. Truman's argument basically goes that three figures are triumphant in the modern mind. And ironically, almost no one has ever read any of their works. And even more ironically, most were actually rejected in their respective fields. These are these three thinkers that permeate modern thinking are Rousseau, Jean Jacques Rousseau, the French philosopher, Karl Marx, and Sigmund Freud. They impact the modern world more than we know. Hardly anyone in this room has read through them. And as someone who has, it's a good thing. They're terrible. They are horrific books to get through. But Jean Jacques Rousseau, his idea was that the true self is the inner self. And anything that hinders you, the chains of religion and authority, must be fettered off and gotten rid of so that you can live your true self. Have you ever heard someone say in the modern world, you can't judge me, this is my truth. That's Rousseau writ large. It was Marx who convinced the modern world of the duality between victim and oppressor and convinced the world that the oppressed could never be evil and the oppressor could never be good. They are antitheses of each other, antithesis of each other, in constant war. And so from Marx came the idea that we must fight for the oppressed. It was until the Frankfurt School a philosophy that they weaponized this from a class struggle into an identitarian struggle. And this is where your ideas of the LGBT uh, and add the symbol after that comes from. And in fact, why it needs to increase in ever increasing variety is because there's always another oppressed battle to fight, right? Well, that comes from Marx. Finally, it was Freud to convince the 21st century person that our true self is the sexualized self. In fact, he, he would argue that that was most important for our happiness and well-being. And it was because of Freud, mostly, because of this obsession that he had to justify getting rid of all traces of guilt within the human soul. And so started what was basically modern therapy. And so we've kind of adopted or found ourselves in a world where all that matters is me, my expression, myself, my fight for the oppressed class, which is mostly me. Yet, in light of this, unable to solve the crisis that revolves and centers in every human life, which is, we feel guilty. In fact, what we try to do is therapize people, you know? Get them into therapy. Get them medicated. Virtue signaling. Any action to solve the crisis of guilt that every single one of us feels. I mean, have you seen TikTok with all the, look at all the good I've done. I mean, what's it called? Uh, uh, where they go around doing acts of good to show the world, which is not actually an act of good. It's just virtue signaling. We, we live in a world like this. And the problem is, no matter what we try and do to numb, excuse, or compensate this gnawing reality of guilt, we find ourselves in a world full of guilty people. 
What we'll see in our text today is that Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, shows that our outward activities have no hope of healing our inward crisis. They just can't. Our guilt needs correction. It needs a judgment. And we'll see how that works. We're not going to read the whole text. It's a very long kind of argument. But what we'll read for the start is chapter 9, 1 to 2, and then we'll jump down to 6, verse 10. So let's read together. It says there in Hebrews 9, 1, Now the first covenant had its regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In the first room were the lampstands and the table with the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Now jump down to verse 6. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in, in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way to the most holy place had not yet been disclosed, as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They were only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applied, applying until the time of the new order. Now, what is brilliant about this argument is that it shows the necessity of the temple and the law. However, in the same line, in the same breath, he says that these are just shadows of the real hope that is now being revealed to us in Jesus. And this leads us to our first point, which is tabernacles, illustrations, and the human conscience. Have you, ever, have you ever stopped to wonder why one of the most consistent acts throughout cultures upon the entire planet is to build temples and shrines and kill animals on these and in these temples and on these shrines to the gods? This is in every nation around the world. You can go to anywhere and you will see the innate need of human beings to offer sacrifices to unseen forces. And the question must come up, why do we do this? And I think it speaks to the reality of our humanity. Humanity has a deep, innate knowledge, a discomfort that we are disconnected from the divine because of our lack of perfection. I think that's obvious to everyone. We lack perfection. We lack connection to holiness and ultimately to God and so we realize that we owe him something and that is what the sacrifice is God through his grace gave Moses the laws to clarify this and the ceremonies of the Jewish religion and all this culminated in the day of Yom Kippur the day of atonement now what's amazing about this is there's a there's a a heresy and we'll get into this uh, New Testament heresy we kind of believe it today uh, that, and we'll get into this next week, but that people in the Old Testament were saved by obeying the law. It's never been true. Do yourself a favor this week if you get a gap, if you need to sleep, go and read through the Levitical laws and the laws of Deuteronomy. Uh, it's a great put a, put it to sleeper. I mean, I shouldn't, but it does. And what you will see is over and over again, if you accidentally, if you happen to, If you, by accident, over and over again, there are laws about mistakes. I remember when I first got saved, I read through that text and I'm like, God, what about the stuff that I'm doing on purpose? Like, how do I get out of that one? I felt quite desperate. The Old Testament gives no hope to moral sins. In fact, if you committed any moral sin in the Old Testament, there was no absolution. There was being taken outside and murdered. Stoned, killed by the community, or cast out. Now this Day of Atonement was a cleansing process. And that was a, it was a resetting of the people of God so that holiness could dwell with them. And, and what would happen was it would start weeks before. The priest would prepare himself. He would actually isolate himself from the whole community. So that he didn't by accident touch anyone else who happened to have touched something that was unclean. 
So he went into complete isolation from his family, from his friends, from everyone, and prepared himself by washing himself constantly and praying and fasting. Then on the actual day, he would wash himself several times before he entered the Holy of Holies. And every single time would be re-clothed in the purest, whitest of linen. Which to show the separation, this need for perfection. On the actual day when he's washed several times, he would then be able to enter the Holy of Holies. But only with the offering of blood to stand in the place of him and the sins of his people. And the writer of the Hebrews actually says something peculiar here in verse 8 when he says, The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way to the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was functioning. In other words, this was, this was a play. This was not actually entering into the very presence of God. It was a stopgap, an illustration, a link to the very presence of God. And here is the point. Notice the intensity of these actions. How many of you would like to, to come to church, you would have to separate yourself for the entire week? Because, I mean, we say we come into the house of God, right? To the presence. You'd have to separate yourself for the entire week, washing constantly. Some of us would like that more than others. And then on the day of church, to wash yourself several times before you enter into the room and before that, you have to make an offering of blood to atone for your sins and the sins of everyone around you. I mean, it'll make you very aware of where you're entering, right? But these were just outward acts. In fact, how much of our actions ever solve the deep crisis of our sins, right? They don't really ever deal with the problems of our heart. And this is the thing. All the sacrifices, all the efforts, all the ceremonial cleaning, all that it did was highlight the disparity between these acts and the crisis that was actually happening in our own hearts. You don't need another act to deal with what you're going through. You don't need another practice, another habit, you need actually correction of your guilt. That is what our crisis is. And this leads us to our second point, which is blood and forgiveness. We're going to read from verse 11 to 14 here. Let's just read. But then Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here. Reader, pay attention. He went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not part of this creation. He did not enter by the means of his blood, oh, sorry, by the means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer sprinkled on those who were ceremony unclean sanctified them so that they were outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ? who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from the acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. Do you notice the contrast in that passage? The contrast of sacrifices? And it's important to notice this because one is of appeasement. Cleanse the outside so that you can... Stand in the place of the other one is in of actual atonement. Let me explain. You see, every single one of us, the older you get, the, the, the more acute this becomes. But every single one of us realize that our place in the world, our existence, is counted by the fact of our own guilt. This is called the, the burden of existence. The thinking human being experiences. Simply put, we live in a world under an incredible burden of our own unworthiness of the life that we've attained. Have you ever experienced that? Every single thinking person on the planet, I think, experiences that in one part of their life. It's sadly unavoidable. And so what we do is we choose to justify our existence by something. So some do it by 
you know, the acceptance of their peers, you know, their, their friendship group or what they can achieve. And, and that is fickle. Because guess what? Friends fight. And accolades become nothing over time. Others still choose to justify their existence by their natural flair. Maybe they're gifted. Maybe they are beautiful. And unfortunately, as they live, so that fades and cracks and perishes. One of the, the best examples of this that I've seen is that of Madonna. Now, Madonna was the archetypal sex symbol of the 1980s. She just was. She was everywhere. And she has so desperately tried to cling on to that as now a basically a granny. And it's a parody. But she's seen it. She's seen her whole life just all that she made her worthwhile, that justified her existence, is fading with every wrinkle and every natural act of age. We might not do that. We might put it in our wealth, our family, our status. However, all of us are trying to escape the burden of our existence, right? Right? We're justifying ourselves. That's what we're doing. When we wake up in the morning, we justify our existence. In a sense, there there remains a constant and fundamental reminder in our souls that this life that we are given, we are not living worthy of it. Am I the only one that experiences that? I think we all experience that, right? And I want to warn you, I want to... I want to warn you, here the lies of Marx and Rousseau are so appealing, especially to young people who haven't experienced life. Uh, one of the dangers of, of youth, can I just throw this out there? You sit in the front. I'm going to pick on you for a little bit. One of the dangers of youth is you haven't lived long enough to realize that you are actually a rubbish. <laughs> just throwing that out there. You are highly convinced of your own worth in the world. Like, I've not done something that bad, you know. I might be bad, I've done some things wrong, but, you know, those old people, now they, they are the real problem. You know, those, it's not the millennials, it's the baby boomers. And, you know, when you guys grow up, Generation Stranger, it will be the millennials. They are the real, real evil in the world. It's the danger of youth. And Marx and Rousseau play on that. Because you know what they convince you of? They convince you that it's not your fault, that you can't justify yourself in the world. It's the system. It's other people. It's their fault that you have a crisis deep within your soul that says, I need to do something to justify myself. And you know, it's not your fault. It's your parents' fault. And if it's not your parents, it's other parents' faults. I mean, we could throw in Freud here as well. I mean, you know... You don't have ADD. I mean, you don't, you know what? you're not lazy at maths. Your mother didn't hug you enough as a kid, you know? And so and so forth it goes. The, the crisis is we know, we know that in fact we ourselves aren't living up to the standards. We just know this. Ray Comfort often uses uh, Francis Safer's illustration. It's brilliant. But you know you don't live up to your own standards. And so Francis Schaeffer made this illustration. He said, imagine if God only judged you by your own standards. Imagine he hung an invisible recorder, video recorder, around your neck. And it only recorded when you judged other people for the sins that you did. And then at the end of the age, he would open up his video screen, you know, he would turn it on. And he would just watch the times when you're judging others for the sins that you commit. And the question is, who would pass even that judgment? Christians in this room, would you pass it? You bunch of sinners. Right? We know that. How many times have you seen someone do something else and you're like, I can't believe that. And two minutes later, you're doing... Exactly the same thing, but with more flair, right? I mean, it's you doing it, you know? I love that old statement, that everyone who drives faster than me is a maniac, and everyone who drives slower than me is an idiot. It's only me who drives well, right? (laughs) On a side note, one of the crises of being on Discovery uh, uh, Insurance 
is it forces you to drive like a grandpa. It's just terrible. And so here's me sticking to the speed limit on the road, and someone always inevitably rides up behind you and flashes, like, why are you driving so slow? I'm like, discovery is forcing me. <laughs> it's actually quite freeing because I, I don't feel like an idiot anymore. I'm just, no, just, I'm getting my points. I need that bonus at the end of the year. Right? We know we don't live up to our own standards, right, church? We know we have this crisis. We give ourselves far more grace than we ever give others. And I'm going to throw that out, church. That happens here as much as it happens out there. And here's the problem. If you're honest with yourself, it's not about just getting away with it. It's not about just, you know, moving on. We live with a crisis that we know we don't live up, and that has to be accounted for. There is no hope in ignoring your guilt. Guilt is one of the few things in life that will not be ignored. It will not. There's no such thing as a private sin. It will pay itself out, because your guilt will be paid. It has to be. You know this deep down. I mean, you know this. When you know you are guilty of something, it weighs heavily on you. It crushes you, as the psalmist would say. It eats away at my bones. We need absolution, not pop psychology. And I think that's why blood was so prevalent in ancient cultures. Because at least there's an act of absolution. There's something dying in my place There's some payment being made. And guess what? It wasn't someone else's blood. It was your blood. It was your herd that you had to offer, right? It was costing you something. And so there was an absolution. There was a payment made. That's what made sense. But the problem is, what does the blood of goats and bulls have to do with my sin? Right? One of the most terrifying thoughts... I've ever, ever had is that nothing I ever do in all of this life will not be held to account. You will stand before the judge of the of the heavens and the earth and he will open his book and start reading. Everything. Everything. It has to be atoned for. It has to be accounted. That is justice. Our misdeeds in the world, our crisis of existence, demands, demands justice. We can't play games here. In fact, your soul tells you that you cannot play games here. That's why we need forgiveness. This creates space for real life change. And this is our third point. We're going to read here from verse 23. It was necessary then for the copy of the heavenly things to to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. That was only a copy of the, the true one. He entered heaven itself. Now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter the heaven to offer himself again and again. In the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood that is not his own. Otherwise Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the age. To do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to to die once and after that face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation for those who are waiting for him. That is the culmination of the entire argument. We are offered real, and I mean this, real forgiveness in Christ. Once for all time. You have truly been atoned for. You see, a judgment, a true judgment, an unbiased judgment, 
awaits everyone at the end of the, time, end of the age. As the writer says, people are destined to die once and after that face judgment. You know this. You know this. The scales of your life will be weighed. And I think any honest person will realize that that means they'll be found wanting. And so what can atone for the many, the countless misdeeds and mistakes, the horrifying embarrassments of your life, the pain that you've wrought upon this planet? What will atone for it? How much can you pay? I think our brains remind of this when we're falling asleep, right? Have you ever had that? When you're just about to fall asleep and suddenly you remember every embarrassing thing you've ever done. I think that's your brain saying, judgment's coming, people. Judgment. We will atone. But how much, how much can we actually pay? I think this is where the, the woke movement has gained traction. It's because an honest person, a real, diligent, honest person, has a sense of their own guilt in the world. And so, so when someone says that you are guilty, even if you're not, guess what they do? They step back. They listen. But the problem is, as soon as you listen, as soon as you step back, you give yourself into that narrative of guilt. And the question needs to be asked, how can we atone? How? What, will, what needs to be offered? Do you know what justice demands? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. That's it. Do you know how you're going to atone for the sins that you've committed upon this planet, for the sins of your fathers and your forefathers? And I'm just saying here, no one in this room sits unguilty. Is you're going to have to give your eyes, your heart, your life to atone. You're going to have to give it all. You're going to have to give yourself. You're going to have to die. But what's the crisis? Death only brings judgment. Does it not? Because there's an infinite debt waiting beyond this debt. You could try giving your life, pouring yourself out for the justice in this world, and you would only face a higher justice that you could never live up to. Thanks be to God, church. I need to say this again. Thanks be to God that He made a way for the chief of sinners to come humbly before Him and say, Forgive me, for I am a sinner. And God doesn't just look at that sinner and say, It's okay, let bygones be bygones. Do you notice God never does that? He doesn't say it's fine, let's just forget it. That's not how Christianity works. Rather, the one who did nothing wrong, the one who lived perfectly, took upon himself every misdeed, every action that you have had in your life, and once for all time, bore it upon himself. As he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was forsaking him for the sins of the world were placed upon his shoulders. The writer of the Hebrews says, once for all, at the culmination of the age, to do away with sin, Christ sacrificed himself. Again, he says, Christ sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. I mean, church, do you hear that this morning? Christ once for all time took away the sins of many. He, the sinless one, took away. Our sins. He, the one unencumbered by sin, took sin upon himself so that it might be taken away. In other words, you are truly forgiven. Now, hear me. You are truly forgiven. I think a lot of us live with the idea that we will be one day truly forgiven. 
That's not the writing. That's not what the New Testament says. It says, you are. The things now have been revealed. Jesus has done it once for all time. So when you sit here this morning, do you realize? Do you pick it up? Do you understand that you are forgiven? Your sins have really been absolved. Not it's okay. This is not pop psychology. This is not a pat on the back and saying, get on, you know. Believe in yourself. This is a declaration that in the justice of the universe, God looks at you and says, it's been paid. Your existence is justified because Jesus has justified it for you. What do you think that would do to your life if we really lived like that? I think that's, that's the power of Christianity. This opens us up to actually live like real human beings. Do you, do you realize that? It changes us because we're not just doing actions to try and make ourselves feel better. I think that's so much of the world is just acting to try and make ourselves be, be, feel better. If you are absolutely absolved, if there's nothing left to prove, do you know that you really can forgive each other? And I mean like really forgive each other. Someone hurts you. What is the instinct? Oh, I would never have done that. The Christian says, I'm the chief of sinners. And you know what? I'm okay. Me and God are fine. Let's, let's, let's forgive. As I have been forgiven, so I'll forgive. Let's look at your work. Let's look at the activities. How much of our activities are an endless grind to justify ourselves? To prove that we are okay? Imagine starting with the idea that I'm absolved. I've got nothing left to prove. Now let me live for the one that made me like that. That's why Paul would say, whatever you do in word or deed, do unto the Lord. It's just living out of the sense of grace, of wonder. Imagine just enjoying life because that's the gift that God has given you. Because there's nothing left to prove. Everything is a gift. Church, this is why it is by faith. Because you know what's going to happen? By the end of today, I'm not even going to say tomorrow. By the end of today, you're going to be reminded that you don't deserve this. Because we're sinners. Have you noticed that? You're going to say something stupid. You're going to do something nasty. You're going to do something that's not right. And your response must not be, oh, I must make up for it. Your response must be to run to the cross of Jesus again. And say, give me your forgiveness again, please. I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. Church, your life will be lived completely upon what you've chosen to place your faith in. If your faith is to justify yourself, you'll be an endless torment, a tornado, a black hole of destruction. If your life is lived in absolution... You will live like him who gave it to you. You'll have life and life in its full. That's the wonder of, that's the, that's the miracle of what Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Lord, you... you you came into the world to die for sinners. And this chief of sinners is, is one you died for. How unworthy I am of that. And yes, that's the point. But your love stretched past the eternity, the, the endless gap that my mistakes made, that my sin made. That my hurtfulness and hatefulness have made. 
You went into that, Lord. You bore it upon yourself. And because of Jesus, Father, you call everyone here child, your beloved. And so, Lord, we worship you this morning. How deep the Father's love for us, that we might be called children of the Most High. Oh, we place our hope in that this morning. We rest in that. And in that we give you glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand as we sing our closing?